Oh, welcome everyone. And a heartfelt thank you for dancing to be with us today. I'm Tisha Mary Lee and I'm currently the Vice President of the Sacred Dance Guild. And I'm joining you from a dark and stormy West Australia. Before we move on to our session today, I would like to invite all of you to take just a moment for us to gather together. Put your hands on your hearts and take a deep breath collectively to simply come into the presence of being. Here and now. On this planet, at this point in time, with all the challenges we are facing, if we could just close our eyes and breathe together. Remembering we are one people on one planet in this one beautiful dance of life. Thank you. So, welcome to the Sacred Dance Guild, second in our series of interviews with honorary members. People whom we consider our living legacies and to whom we are asking five important questions. And these questions were specifically created by the team who are working on our legacy project. After 62 years of experience, the Guild has decided that now is the time to create a process of accreditation for sacred dance facilitators across the world. There are a number of aspects to the project. One of them is to discover some of the gems that those who have been doing this work for many years can share with those of us here in the present so that they can be documented for those who will follow us into the future. This thought birthed the five important questions and this interview series. Originally, these were just going to be one-on-one -on -one interviews that we would record these duels. But now, with the technology that's become available, we thought, why not open them up and invite others to share? So here we all are today. Thank you. And we are absolutely delighted, me especially, that Laura Shannon has agreed to be the second interviewee in our series. In 2018, on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Sacred Dance Guild, six individuals honouring the six decades that the Guild had in its history accepted our invitation to be honorary members, joining those legacies from the past. Ted Sean, Ruth St. Dennis, Jess Mika, Horace Cogan, Jean Erdman, as well as our living legacy, Carla de Sola, who is still dancing in her beauty with us today. We believe that these individuals are gifts to the world of sacred dance. And today, Laura will be sharing her gift with all of us. However, before we continue with the interview, we're just going to run through a few little technical issues because we know that using technology is new to many of us and in the dance community and otherwise. But we are grateful that so many of you have dived in and danced forward to embrace this way 
of being socially present with us whilst physically distant. At this most challenging but also hopeful time in our collective history. We are hopeful that the technology gods and goddesses are smiling down on us today. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so first, I'm going to introduce you to the president of the Sacred Dance Guild, Wendy Morell, who is with us doing our tech. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, everybody. <laughs> We'll be monitoring the chat feature. So if you've not used that before, there is a chat button. We've got everyone muted so that we can all focus without any of the background noises. But if you have um, chat um, questions or queries or anything you want to ask, then use the chat feature and type it in and Wendy will be able to read it and collate those um, queries or questions for the end of the interview. Um, we've tested our sound and videos and they're all functioning. So if you are having any issues at all, then we suggest that you um, leave, switch off any other programs that may be running and then come back mm -hmm. and if need be, adjust your video and your sound. Okay. So, Without further ado, I would like to introduce Laura, whom I was blessed to meet at the Findhorn Festival of Sacred Song and Dance in 2014, where she was presenting both dance and music. I personally find her story as a sacred dancer to be inspirational and her work with women's ritual dancers, which is her main focus, is recognized as unique. Planning the world as she shares her dancing wisdom and teaches across Europe to Canada, North America, South America, North Africa, and Australia. She is the founding director of the Athena Institute for women's dance and culture based in Germany. And her academic and scholarship skills have just been assisting her to complete her master's degree at Canterbury Christchurch University in England. And her dissertation was titled The Esoteric Wisdom of Women's Traditional Safe Circle Dance. Sorry. So I think that gives you a flavour of what we're in for this evening. We're actually going to show a little clip, which Wendy will share on the screen, um, a little video clip of Laura dancing before we um, hand over to Laura to talk to us. So Wendy, let's have a look at that clip. Thank you. Thank you. 
you, Wendy. That was a little bit syncopated for me, but there are clips on YouTube, so you please feel free to check out Laura on YouTube and watch more of her dances yourself. But handing over to Laura now, a very warm welcome, Laura, and thank you so much for accepting this invitation to share your sacred dance experiences and wisdom with all of us today. So let's start with a little bit about your personal journey in sacred dance. Thank you so much. And really thank you, Tricia and Wendy for inviting me firstly to be one of the uh, honorary lifetime members of the Sacred Dance Guild. It was just an incredible highlight and affirmation for me to be able to join some of my own wise guides and mentors. Um, and I am very, very grateful to be here with you all today. And also for all of you that have come from all over the world. I've seen a lot of people I recognize in our list of participants. And um, I thank you all for, for joining us today. I, um, I'm very moved just by watching that video. Uh, I didn't uh, quite remember which one of the videos you were going to choose to show. That's from the end of one of the two year trainings that I offer in Germany, in, in Sweden, in Austria, in Canada, and in the USA on um, of women's ritual dances. And I think that gives you a good idea of what I will be talking about because these very simple dances that women dance together, we were a little short of space on that particular day, but you can imagine that as well as dancing in a line and dancing in a spiral and snake form, which you saw in that film, that we also dance in a circle, which is almost always an open circle and one woman is leading that circle. And I will talk about that later, how the circle and also this um, pattern of shared leadership, both are very important aspects of the women's ritual dances. Now, Tricia has invited me to share a little bit about my story, how I came to sacred dance and how I came to this particular kind of sacred dance, the women's ritual dances. So I'll just dive in and I hope I don't forget anything. <laughs> uh, I grew up in the United States, you can probably hear from my voice, but as quite a young adult, I moved to Europe. I lived in France, uh, England, Scotland, and Greece. And um, I was already very interested in dance as a teenager and I had had experience of international folk dance. These are these Balkan dances in the open circle, which the women's ritual dances are one segment of this much larger field. And anyone who's danced Balkan dance or folk dance has experienced something of these dances. And I'm just focusing on the women's ritual dances, but it's going to be familiar to all of you who've already experienced circle dance in the traditional folk dance sense or circle dance in what's known as sacred circle dance, where it's more of a group meditative experience. That was brought into the English speaking world by a German dance master, Bernhard Rosin, who came to the Findhorn community in Scotland, an ecological and spiritual community, a non-denominational, non-dogmatic community based on gardening, actually, um, by Bernhard Rosin, this German dance master who combined traditional circle dances that he had learned from his childhood in Northern and Eastern Europe with choreographed dances to modern music, mainly classical music. And all of it was with this purpose of serving a community feeling and a group development as well as individual insight and consciousness. And I first encountered Fintorn sacred dance in the mid 1980s when I was still a teenager and I immediately felt that I had been looking for this all of my life, a meaningful way to connect with people by joining hands in a circle as we've just seen, sharing simple steps together in synchrony as we've seen and having this deep feeling of connection regardless of whether we agreed about religion, politics, uh, all of these important things that seem to be causes of division in the sacred dance practice, we could transcend those 
and I, I knew right away this is what I was wanting to experience and what I wanted to devote my life to doing. So I immediately trained as a sacred dance teacher in the Findhorn style. But when I came to sacred dance, I already had, as I said, this background in international folk dance, also in women's Middle Eastern dance, oriental dance, sometimes called belly dance, but not as a performative art, as a personal development also. And also I had a lot of experience in the States before I came to Europe with the women's spirituality circles of the 1980s, which were very much based on the rhythms of the earth and an interest in rediscovering the ancient goddesses from the pre-patriarchal times. So with those combined interests, it was only natural that my uh, passion within the sacred dance sphere, which had a repertoire of thousands of dances, my passion was to research the women's traditional dances, not only because with choreographed dances, lots of people are doing them and lots of people are making new ones. They don't feel like they are endangered species in the way that the traditional dances came to seem to me. Uh, but it was also that in the sacred dance realm, I suppose the idea at that time in the 1980s was that it was a kind of a new age practice with an emphasis on the light and the spirit and the esoteric wisdom of the dances was very much based on the passion of the Christ or the hero's journey. I didn't find my journey as a woman reflected in the choreographed dances of the sacred dance repertoire, but I did find my experience reflected in the women's dances of the Balkans once I started to travel there. Uh, in the international folk dance groups that I had been attending in England and in the USA and in France and other places where I was traveling, I noticed that most of the dancers were women, but most of the teachers were men, and most of the dances in the repertoire tended to be men's dances or in men's style, meaning they were often with fast, complex steps, sometimes more physical or more athletic with a lot of running, jumping, leaping. It seemed at that time in the 1980s that what people thought was exciting and rewarding in a dance was to master a complex structure, to remember it, to get through it, to break a sweat, and then immediately move on to the next one. But when I started my travels in the Balkans, which was beginning in 1987, and since then actually I went to every every single Eastern European country and some of the former Soviet countries as well, uh, Armenia, Turkey, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, of course, Greece and Bulgaria is where I centered my research. I haven't been to Lithuania, but I've been to all of the other Eastern European countries looking for these dances. And I saw something completely different, which is that most of the dances were simple dances so that everyone in the whole community could come together with a simple step like the one that you maybe sort of saw flashes of in that slightly jerky film we saw earlier. Very simple dances where immediately you're at home, you don't ever have to worry about remembering, there is no risk of injury, and whatever your age or level of fitness, you can be at home in that circle with no possible danger to yourself. You're not going to sprain an ankle or tear a knee cartilage. Um, Trisha asked me especially not to forget that uh, when I was 20, I did tear my knee cartilage <laughs> dancing a rather complex men's dance from Armenia. And um, this was uh, one of those life-changing moments that you don't see coming in for a long time, I thought it was bad luck because I was told by specialists that I would never dance again. And it's true that there are a lot of dances that I, I couldn't do with that torn cartilage, but there were lots of dances that I could do. And what I found very interesting in this journey of discovery was it was the simple dances. And then I found out those simple dances tended to be the women's dances. And they also tended to be the oldest dances. Now, of course, women dance athletic, exuberant dances as well, particularly in the Balkans. The young women who have reached menarche are technically 
of marriageable age, technically they're fertile, but in those years before they actually do marry, they are a very special, almost a sacred group within the society. They're considered to have this magic potentiality of fertility and they express that in their ritual dances, often with uh, running, jumping, leaping, stamping, often also with simple steps. But the dances for women who have um, entered the phase of life where they are married, where they're mothers, they tend to dance the gentle dances from there on out. Why is that? Because we might still be young and fit, but if we have our period, maybe we don't feel like running and jumping and leaping today. Or if we're pregnant, newly pregnant, having a difficult pregnancy, we just had a baby, we're nursing a baby. There's all kinds of times, often many kinds of times in the life of an adult woman where the running, jumping, leaping, stamping dances aren't going to feel good for her, for her body. So you have automatically this reason why the women's dances tend to be simple and they tend to be relatively easy physically to do with no risk of injury. And it's a bit like Tai Chi or very gentle yoga. By dancing them, you receive this healing energy without risk of further energy. And that was my experience as I was healing from my injured knee. So I would say now that that injury is actually what guided me to explore the women's dances. By force of necessity, they were the only ones I could do. I'm not sure I would have given up so easily that sense of accomplishment and pride that we all had when we were mastering those difficult dances at folk dance class. But that's what happened. And so then I spent the rest of my adult life, actually more than 30 years, 35 years, traveling and researching these women's dances and trying to teach them in my seminars, as Tricia pointed out, all over the world, because I felt early on that these dances had an inherently therapeutic quality, which I was very interested in exploring because of the very ancient quality of these dances too. I did a training after my first degree in intercultural studies, which opened my mind towards the just amazing miracle of being able to learn from people who come from other places, other religions, other languages, other ethnicities, from our own point of view. I then trained in dance movement therapy in order to try to better understand what's happening when we're dancing these dances and how can we create a space for women in our own circles outside of Greece or Armenia or Bulgaria to experience the same inherently healing quality without it needing to be a dance therapy session or without the teacher needing to be the therapist, that the dancers themselves create a container that can hold that process. This was very interesting for me. So that's what I've done. I've traveled all over the Balkans, most especially, as I said, in Greece and Bulgaria. I've been to many remote villages. It's been my incredible honor to be welcomed by Grandmothers who've shown me their dances, their songs, their rituals, their embroideries, who've taught me about their way of life and who have helped me understand that these dances are not just movements, but they are embedded in a matrix of a way of life that actually goes back very far. Um, I don't know what else to, to say about uh, my journey, Tricia. I guess, um, <laughs> I guess the, you did mention also my love of of scholarship and it's true that from the very beginning I had a kind of dual engagement with these dances where I could feel their healing power working with me especially in my time of great need but I also had this analytical and scientifically oriented left brain mind that wanted to know how it worked and 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 what makes the dances sacred and how, how do we know that they're ancient and why is it important? And I was always very curious about why in the sacred, the modern sacred circle dance movement, we make lots and lots of choreographies, thousands, tens of thousands of choreographies, which are very beautiful. But why is it that in the Balkans, one village might have three or four main dances and another five or 10 special ones and dance those forever and not change them and not be allowed to change them? This got me thinking, and this was confirmed by my uh, field research over all these years. 
the women don't innovate their steps. They are not allowed to change them. They say they must pass them on as they received them. It's the law. <laughs> and they, uh, it's on, the impression I got was that the dances are like a, a recipe, a recipe for something that is a little bit difficult to make, like uh, fermenting something or making sourdough bread. There are certain laws you really do have to follow if you want it to come out, or, or a herbal remedy. You don't want to mix up your numbers of drops of your tinctures because they do have a powerful effect. And so this was my feeling that the steps we do and the way that we do them are recipes passed down from really the very beginning of agriculture in the Neolithic age, going back eight, nine, maybe 10,000 years. And they are teaching us, or giving us the chance to have an experience that has this inherently healing quality, the same way that we can drink uh, a tea of willow bark, the same way that Neolithic ancestors would have drunk that same tea. And for that aspirin-like effect, it relieves our pain. There's something that has survived from this very ancient past that still affects those of us who come to these dances today. And that's what I've been trying to explore and also to write about. I finished my master's thesis quite recently, but I've also published a number of papers in other uh, peer reviewed journals or chapters and books, just trying to bring an understanding of what these dances are, why they're unique, why they're so important. So uh, I think Wendy will uh, send a list of some of those if anyone's interested and some of it's on my website also. Uh, because of that, approach as a kind of scholar practitioner. I have come to love and respect these dances just more than I can possibly say. And the women who have kept them alive to teach them to me and the many women, the hundreds of women, thousands of women who've come to my seminars or been in my trainings, who have done this work to learn those recipes and to engage with the healing power of the dances for their own benefit because we we've, we've all learned together and i've learned from my students i'm sure much more than they've ever learned from me so is that uh, is that enough about my journey here trisha did you have anything else you wanted to ask all right you've got your five questions oh. <laughs> yes laura thank you i think you know we could listen to you and and share with you for you know the whole the whole process but we do want to pick your brains for our five special questions and as you said Wendy will be sending out a list of resources I have your book here which I will give a little or your book that has a the book that has a section from you which has a lot of your information so I will highlight that at the end but for now yes if we can we will move on to our first um, spotlight question and ask you about your thoughts on creating sacred space. We know you dance outdoors, we know you dance indoors, um, you may be working with site-specific dance, but do you think you could shed some light for us on your concept of creating sacred space for dance? Thank mm, you. That's such a wonderful question. Uh, for me, these circle dances create sacred space in and of themselves, not only because when you form a circle, which I'll let you all imagine, since we didn't quite see a circle on the film we saw earlier, uh, but I know a lot of you have experienced dancing in a circle, holding hands in a circle, the sacred space is there. And the ancient nature of these dances means that when you have the good fortune to travel in the places where these dances still exist, the sacred space is automatically given to those dances with the right space, the right time, the whole community knows what it is, cherishes it, and it all automatically unfolds in a safe way. For us, however, we need to, I think, take conscious steps to create a safe container for the dance circle to fulfill its highest potential as sacred space. So in order to reach that level of, of spirit, we have to really start at the very practical ground level. One of my great mentors, Marsha B. Leventhal, who was the director of the dance movement therapy training program I took part in more than 30 years ago now at the Roehampton Institute in London. She talked about the need for dance therapy 
to be held within a sacred container called a temenos. And she talked about how you need to clear your sacred space on a very practical level. Furniture, uh, you sweep the floor, you take care of your lighting and your sound. And I've noticed in the Balkans also that when the women are going to perform a ritual in their village, for instance, on the feast day, where they'll dance in the village square wearing their costumes. They spend weeks and days beforehand cleaning absolutely everything, their houses, the church, the platea, they whitewash it all. And so this level of housework is the creation of the sacred space. And we do that also inside. When we are coming into the circle, which is a sacred space, and allowing that sense of connection with the earth, with the sky, with one another, with ourselves, with the ancestors and with those who will come after us to dance these same dances, that gives us the chance also to clear away and clean and do a kind of inner housework or an inner tidying. This is how the dance healing takes place when the sacred space of our own bodies and minds is brought into the container or the temenos of the dance circle. We have the chance to simply let go of old thought forms, old patterns, old habits, old reactions, and be lifted out of those personal limitations into the transpersonal sacred space of the circle. Then when we come back to ourselves, having been freed from those limitations, we are transformed. This has been my experience of dancing. Uh, these dances. And I believe that the women whose dances uh, we dance, the women's ritual dances of the Balkan and Greek traditions, they are completely conscious of doing this sacred work of creating sacred space because so many of their dance songs, and you have to imagine now that the women are singing while they're dancing a lot of the time, so many of their dance songs name images that are metaphors for sacred space. They'll talk about a monastery. They'll talk about a, a harbor. They'll talk about a garden with a, or an orchard with a protective wall. They'll talk about a castle on a mountain that's safe and, and protected. Many, many images of the safe and sacred space are present in the women as they sing while they dance. And we can enter that too, even if it's us women from all religions or none from all over the world, uh, any race, religion, language, we can come into this circle and find that sacred space. Because women dance in circle form, actually not just in Eastern Europe where I focused my research, but all over the world, this creation of sacred space is something that's universal in indigenous dancing. For women particularly, it gives them a space where they can be protected and show their power, experience themselves and support one another in the experience of being powerful and being seen as powerful in their society. I never had that when I was growing up in the West. And I think that dancing in this way gives the sacred space then not just in the circle, not just in our body, in our mind, in our lives, but also in the larger culture. Does that Thank answer you. your question, Trisha? I, I think that's, yeah, I think that's lovely, Laura. I just quote a little bit from your book, from your article in the book, Emma, and that is that one thing you said was that the values that come through within the dancers that you're teaching are egalitarian, cooperative, and the quality of peace. And I think all of those contribute also to the sacred space. And I love that you brought those values in. So thank you. Oh, you're okay. so, uh, Yes, I just want to say you're so right about that. And that's how we create the sacred space within our society as well, by practicing those values and bringing them into being. I hope we can come back and talk about those values a little bit more, but I can see it's time to move on yeah. to our next question. Sorry, I know, I, we have to talk <laughs> We could talk all night, couldn't we? Yes, we could talk all day. Um, question, number, <laughs> question number two is, what are your thoughts 
in creating sacred community and in a way you've already started to answer this so creating sacred community in groups um, when you're participating and when you're leading how mm. is this um, part of your art because it certainly is thank you oh thank you Trisha you know that's another wonderful question and we did already start to touch on it with the um, mention of the values of the dance that the dances are so old from the dawn of agriculture in the Neolithic era shows that they're the indigenous dances of European civilizations that come from the pre-Indo-European incursions and that means that they are pre-religious, pre-monotheistic religion, uh, so to speak, and also pre-patriarchal. So we're in a completely different kind of society that lives by different values egalitarian, cooperative, peaceful, with no gender hierarchy, no gender oppression, and without fortifications in villages, and with weapons for hunting, but no weapons of war. We know this from the research of archaeologists, particularly the work of Maria Gimbures, who researched uh, the civilizations of old Europe, as she calls it, this whole area of the Balkans where the circle dances are most still alive, they also have these roots of ancient civilizations that are based on egalitarian cultures of peace. And you can tell this from the graves. Everyone's bones show that everyone had the same amount to eat. But later on, you see a hierarchical society where some people had enough and other people starved or were enslaved or were beaten or whatever. So this is a very important understanding for all of us, and we could have an entire discussion only about this, but the dances have their roots in communities that are based on peaceful, cooperative, mutually supportive and egalitarian principles. This means that there is another way because there once was another way. And if we dance these dances and practice these values in the dance circle, we can bring them into being in our lives and that's how we can create community. Apart from that larger picture, it always begins with ourselves. We come together in peace. And I'll just tell you very briefly, one of the villages where I've done research in Greece, a village on the foothills of Mount Olympos, the farmers have a fruit packing cooperative and they work together to sell their fruit um, from everyone in the village. This is almost unheard of in Greece where normally every family is producing and selling for themselves and so they're in competition with one another and they uh, do a lot of other cooperative things in this village called Melias. They were donating everyone's labor to build a communal project, a retaining wall uh, by the road under the, the hill that their church was on. Everyone just gave what they had, their time, their labor, the rock from the quarry, the, they lent their trucks, the petrol from the guy who had the petrol station, the women took turns cooking for the workers every day, another family would cook. And I asked them how they managed to bring this community spirit into action in such an unusual way, because at that time in the Greek economic crisis about 10 or 12 years ago, we weren't seeing a lot of that. And they said, oh, it's because in our village, we all still dance together every Sunday. I said, really? Yes, we've never stopped. We've always done it and we've never stopped. And the example this grandfather gave me, he said, you can be very angry with your neighbor or your cousin and ready to start a feud that will last for generations. And in other places that happens, you see it. But when you come together and hold his hand and dance next to him and sing together, he said, all of that fades away. And then he listed all these other villages in the same area didn't have the same spirit of cooperation. And he said, and they don't dance together every Sunday anymore either. And that's why. So we come together and we have the chance not only to move beyond our personal limitations, but to forgive each other and to be forgiven all those little things that often can divide us or can end friendships or cause these big uh, Greek, <laughs> Greek style, Greek sized feuds, Greece being the home, not just of drama, but of melodrama, but it can happen anywhere, but dancing prevents it. And I've seen too how people can maintain friendships through thick and thin through many, many years when they have a regular practice of dancing together. 
The other thing about community is this question of leadership in the open circle. You probably got a glimpse in that film of the first dancer, which was me in that particular case, holding a dance handkerchief uh, in the right hand. Usually the dancers go to the right, so the leader is on the right, and she usually has a handkerchief in her right hand, which is a sign to everyone who's leading. And if there's thousands of people there, it's always good to be able to see and to know. But that role of leadership will change. The women will take turns leading the circle. And in every village, you have some women who love that role and they're the first ones to jump up and lead and they remember the songs, they remember how the dances begin. But there are other women who are naturally shy, who might be introverted, who might think they would rather die than get up and be the one to lead the dance. But if it's the right occasion, like their wedding or their son's wedding, they need to step into that role. So every woman throughout her life is brought up to develop leadership skills, whether it's her natural tendency or not. And then you have a community in which everyone can be a leader. And the ones who are naturally inclined to take on the mantle of leadership, they get to practice passing it on, giving it up, not always being the one in charge. And when you think about it, these dances come from communities that have been through incredible crises, times of conflict, times of change. So if every woman in your community has trained in herself to know in her cellular memory by dancing thousands of times, she can do it, she can lead, because it's, uh, it's a lot of qualities and skills you have to develop at the same time if you want to have that first position in the circle. But you know, everyone can do that. Everyone can count on each other in a way that's all about investing in the, the well-being and the survival of the community. And we find that too. When I'm dancing with my women's groups, these women's ritual dances, okay, they've been exported from their home realm. And as I said, we have to create the sacred space for those dances with some practical work because it's not automatically there in our culture. But we see over the years, how the women are encouraged to trust themselves as leaders in their own lives and find the courage to make changes that perhaps might have been daunting before. And then when the women change their lives, find their power, live and fulfill their potential, we have a completely different kind of community than when the women are afraid to make those changes because there's no support for them. So those are some of the ways that these women's ritual dances very practically, but also on a high uh, level of, of metaphor can develop community in the women who dance them. And, and I think by helping each individual fulfill her potential, create a community and a society that can reach its potential also. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That's lovely that you take that broad span of experience, Laura. Thank you. So question number three, um, how does the sacred manifest through movement and dance in your work, in your daily practice and in your personal community and I think after this or during this you're going to actually give us a little demonstration so we look forward to that. Thank you. Yes, uh, we were thinking how nice it would be to actually dance so in a moment we're going to get up together and dance a little dance together so you can feel for yourself how the sacred manifests in movement. I will just say that it's changed my life completely to spend this time doing this research to see how the women live and how they treat their own home as a sacred space, the way that they clean it with love and devotion, the same way that they clean the church in their village, helped me to understand keeping my house clean and by extension, keeping everything else in order as much as possible in, in life that this is an extension of sacred dance, that the dance circle doesn't end when we come back into the kitchen. It's just another space in which we can maintain that connection to earth and sky, to ourselves and each other, to the ancestors and to those who will come after us. And to engage in all of that work in a sacred manner 
was a real teaching for me. I hadn't really understood that growing up in the feminist 70s of the United States where the conversation was much more about how to liberate ourselves from the shackles of housework that had been unfairly and unjustly placed on women. I see it in a different way because of spending 35 years visiting women who are like priestesses in the temple of their home and the way that the sacred manifests for them in everything they do has been something I've tried to learn from and emulate myself. Um, I think we are able to do that in our daily lives because we practice it in the dance. So we're going to do a little dance, but before you stand up, I'll just show you with my miniature dancer here what we're going to do. We're going to dance forward three steps and one step back. One, two, three, and one step back. And we'll do that two times. And then we'll come into the center with three steps. One, two, three, and we'll sway four times. One, two, three, and four. And coming out of the center with three steps. One, two, three, and we sway in place four times. One, two, three, four. And then facing around the circle to the right again, we have our pilgrim step again. Three steps forward and one step back, which we'll do two times. These are traditional movements which you find in cultures of many dances and many religions. Um, the pilgrim step, three steps forward and one step back, is danced by Jews, Christians, Muslims, and other ethnic and religious groups. It has that quality of the seasons of the year that go forward and one step back like winter where you have a chance to rest and retreat. I think it reminds us among other things that we've got to have rest in the rhythm of our lives, something easy to forget in the modern world. But it also shows us that those times of going back, it could be an illness, it could be an injury, it could be a depression, it could be a global crisis or a pandemic, something that feels like, ah, a retreat doesn't have to be seen as something terrible. It can be seen as part of the rhythm and we can then trust that it will move forward again the way that in the winter we trust that spring will come because we've danced it and we have that knowledge in ourselves. And when we come into the center, these um, we have to imagine that we all come together, we're closer to each other, we see each other better, and that in many brides dances is a symbol of initiation that we then are on the threshold of transformation and change and we sway on the threshold because the feet have to be a little bit apart there's no way you can sway uh, your whole body from side to side if your feet are together the feet need to be apart and in many ritual dances of women this is about opening the space between our feet to the gateway of our own generative organs and the sacred and fertile creative life force that is within us, not just to have children, but in everything that we do within that sacred home, within our dancing, our handwork, all of that power is activated and consecrated when we come together into the center. So I'd like to invite you to join me and join each other in our dancing circle. I am going to show you the step one time here together. I hope you can see me. Oh, yes, sorry, I've got the long dress on, but there's a quick fix for that. Excuse me, just one moment. Okay, so I hope you can sort of see my feet. We're going to go forward with the right foot. One, two, three, and one step back. Again, three, Steps forward, one step back, and we come into the center now with one, two, three. We sway left, two, three, and four, and step back, two, three. And again, starting with the pilgrim step, moving to the right. Step back, and one, two, three, and one step back. You are welcome to place your hands on your heart. If you wish for this dance, we would normally be holding hands. And this is an adaptation of traditional Jewish women's dance steps to a wedding song from the Jewish community on the Greek island of Rhodes, which was brought from Spain at the end of the 15th century in the time of the Inquisition and the great diaspora that happened there. 
I wanted it to be a dance for us of compassion and, and understanding, understanding of who may have um, suffered exile or persecution because this is one of the great themes that we're living through right now. But also to get to the roots of the time, for instance, in Spain, the centuries when Christians, Muslims, and Jews lived together in peace in the, the Covivencia, and they even, even intermarried. This peace among the nations is something that we can kindle again in our society, in our community, with the conscious practice in the dance circle. So it's a wedding song where the bride would be prepared by her female friends and relatives in the mikvah, the ritual bath. And it's comparing this bath water to the water of the sea. So a truly transformative, tremendous power. That is the power of change. But when we all come together into that threshold, we see that we help each other feel strong even in those moments. And when we go back, that's where we're going, where we can't see, we don't see behind us, but we can trust that going into the unknown, symbolized by stepping backward, we're safe, we're held, we're protected, we're supported. So if you'd like to join me, you're very welcome. If you don't have a lot of space to dance where you are, just do what you can on the spot. You can even sit in your chair. You can also just enter that meditative space with love and compassion for your own transitions and any times of unexpected change, I mean, we're all facing that at some level. So this is a dance that I think, um, I hope can help hold some of the feelings that we might have around the, the crisis that we're all in at the moment. Thank you. 
space of your own body and your own being, how women before you for thousands of years, countless generations, have danced in circle to support each other through challenging times. I'm just taking a moment to honestly acknowledge the challenges of our time with compassion to simply witness the threshold beneath your feet, beneath our feet. And breathe into yourselves this beautiful movement of the dance that takes us safely through those challenges, takes us safely over the threshold and activates our own creative life force, which gives us the power to respond. And if you're feeling in your hands, I don't know how you have your hands when we dance, but you might want to bring them together or in your heart. I'd like to invite you to take the healing energy of the, hand, of the dance in your hands and just place your hands anywhere you might like to on your body, anywhere that you might have a place that's sore, that would like some healing touch, just intuitively allow your hands to come to that place. So the gift of the healing power of the dance can be like a healing balsam wherever you most need to receive it. And then let's also place our hands again on our heart and breathe it in for love and compassion and healing and support for ourselves and one another. And when you're ready, we'll come back to our sacred space of the talking circle, the talking square. I, that, was, that was really beautiful to share. I think I speak for everybody. It was beautiful to just have that connection together. Um, and it leads very well into this next um, question number four, which is, um, why do you do what you do? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> more great questions. Um, I kind of feel like I didn't really um, have a choice. I was always following a kind of a call that I felt from when I was very young, growing up in suburban United States, lots of things were great. We didn't have any wars. We had enough to eat and went to school and 
life was good, but at the same time, something was missing that I found in sacred dance practices from the different cultures that I studied. It was something about the connection between the earth and the heaven as sacred, the body, the mind, and the spirit all as sacred, that the female was sacred, and to find the female face of the divine and ways to connect with each other that would transcend these ridiculous things that seem to be sources of division to the point where people were ready to kill each other because you believe this and I believe that. I could never see the point. And yet you can't talk people out of those convictions. For me, it's when you join hands in dance that we transcend those difficulties and live that culture of peace. I feel very fortunate that I was given many opportunities and that I also followed them. Um, I want to say that I, I found some wonderful teachers at the beginning. Zuleika is an ecstatic dancer who lives in Santa Fe, who helped me very much in the years that I studied with her to understand that Indigenous and ethnic dance traditions, it's amazing that in our time we have access to things that were kept secret for so long, but it's as if the call that we all feel in our hearts has led us to sources of wisdom and practices of, of healing, which can help us on that, that journey following that call. And she said, it's not going to look like what it looks like in Bali or Bulgaria or wherever, but we can feel what they feel when they dance. And that's the call that I've been following in my own limited way, because we're all human and we're all flawed. We can only do what we do the way we each do it. And for me, it's been important to follow that call, despite the obstacles, follow the call to be a dancer, even after I wrecked my knee and surprise, all the doctors were wrong. I didn't only dance again, I made an entire life and career out of dancing. So following that call often went against every possible logical uh, conclusion or opinion that was around me. And I, I trust that having dedicated myself to this journey then I'll be given what I need to continue or shown the way that I need to go. It's not so much that I have a plan as that I feel that I'm following a path that's been shown to me. And for me, that path led to, led to a well. It led to a holy well that is the source of that peace, that justice, that egalitarian society and community, honoring the feminine, honoring the earth, that I was looking for since my childhood. And I think there are many ways to that well. So I do what I do because it takes me there. I can name a hundred other teachers working with sacred movement. Their way takes them there too, and your way will take you there. And this is the thing about being human and having, having faults and flaws. I didn't let my injury stop me when I was 20. And it's very interesting that um, I went through all of that again six years ago. I fell off my bicycle. I broke my back. I had to learn to walk again and had a head injury, which affected all of, all of my cognitive processing and slowed, slowed all that down. In fact, I still walk with a cane. So that may always be the case. That's what the doctors say. They could be wrong again. But the truth is, you know, it's a little bit difficult. And I guess if you want to be a dancer, but actually you're a person who can't even walk, most people would say, well, yes, that's sort of a flaw in the plan of being a dancer. But if even I can still dance, then I know that anyone can get something out of these dances because they are gentle enough and they give enough healing energy that I have more, more energy and feel better and stronger and more revitalized after dancing than I did before I started. And I think that's the secret to these dances. This is also the answer. Why do I do what I do? Because it gives me the vitality, the energy, the healing, the insight, the companionship 
that I'm looking for in my life, as well as that connection to the sacred, the sacred in the earth, the sacred in the heaven, the sacred in these ancient female traditions. And so what if I can't walk? Um, you see in the Balkans, a lot of very old women, old with, they've got bad knees, bad backs too. They still not only dance, but they're the best dancers. They're the most powerful dancers and they have the highest honor, which is sort of the opposite to the way in the West we tend to think about dancing. You need to be young, you need to be fit, you need to be slim. Actually, it's not the young, slender women who have the power in the Balkan dance circles. It's the old, heavy grandmothers, the crones, the wise women, the menopausal women. They have the power and the honor in the dance. And that helps me to believe that I can keep doing what I do, maybe also until I'm an 80 year old crone. I hope I hope I live that long and, and get there. I'm already practicing with the not being able to walk part. But my feeling is that even a lame horse can lead her rider to the water. So I would say that's true of every one of you, um, that you can find your way to your source, whatever your limitations, whatever the apparent obstacles. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. And for sharing your story, which, yeah, is, is an inspiration for all of us. And we come now to the final of the five questions. And this is, if there was just one thing that you could uh, convey and share with others who are facilitating sacred dance events, or who are sacred dancers in their own journey, what would that one piece of wisdom be? I think it has to follow on from what I was just saying, that it doesn't matter if you're a lame horse and don't let what you think of as your flaws or your challenges get in the way of you doing your sacred work in the world because your life is a sacred dance and your body and your home and your community are sacred spaces for sacred dance. And when you dance without fear and with trust and compassion for yourself, then you're also creating the society that we want to live in where we have that compassion for one another. I can't think of anything more important than fostering that acceptance and tolerance and compassion and love across the divides that are burning up our world right now. But that starts within, with the love for yourself, despite your flaws, forgiveness for yourself, because if you can allow yourself to do your work in sacred dance, then you give permission to others to be their best selves and stand up in our world as the best we can be, to give the best we can give. And then that will come back to us all. I think it's urgent because we need to confront some big challenges right now as a community. There's this deadly virus, there's the threat of global heating and catastrophic climate change, and there are these structures of hierarchical power that are completely outdated yet still wreaking such havoc and harm. It's all the same picture. So we start very small with two hands that we hold, two steps that we take, but we're affirming another way of being through our sacred dance. It starts with acceptance, but then you move on and you demand that we live together with peace, justice, and tolerance. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just wish to close by showing everybody your book, well, the book in which Laura has written an article, which is beautiful. It's published by Finn Tom Press. And I just want to finish with what is almost a prophetic quote. Um, towards the end of the article, Laura says, in the past, women danced to ensure their own survival and that of their families and communities. In our time, what is at stake 
is the survival of the earth and all living beings. May you all dance in compassion and peace. Thank you, Laura. Thank, Thank you, Wendy.